Lord, we love you, Lord. We are always grateful, Lord, to gather together in your name, Lord. It always feels good to be in your house. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that we can turn to passages just, just like this and be encouraged and find instruction and find learning, Lord God, so that our lives, Lord God, can be made better for it, so that our marriages, Lord God, can be made better for it. And so, Lord, we're just grateful, Lord God. We humble ourselves. We look to you. We know that your word is truth, and we pray it would be you tonight that by the power of your spirit would speak to your people. Bring that insight. Bring that encouragement, Lord. I'll even pray ahead of time, Lord, for those maybe marriages that are struggling. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful passage we come to to find wisdom and instruction in your word. And so be glorified, Lord God. Meet with us here. I pray for those tuning in online as well. Bless them as well. Speak to them as well. We love you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Good evening. Good evening. Let's turn our Bibles to Song of Solomon, chapter 5 tonight. Song of Solomon, chapter 5 tonight. Again, of course, picking up right where we left off last week. We ended, we actually covered the first verse of chapter 5, and so, of course, we'll pick it up in verse 2 in just a few minutes. Now, as I always do, again, uh, I always do this because I want anyone at any time, a year from now, five years from now, if the Lord tarries, to be able to Tune into a message and, and know exactly why we have what we have. And so always remember, kind of just giving that, you that quick recap of what we covered in verse 1 or, or back in chapter 1. I shared with you again, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29, the Bible records that God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure. He prayed for that. He was a young king placed upon the throne, was tasked with ruling over the kingdom of, of Israel and Judah. And so he prayed to God for wisdom and, and understanding to lead the people, to govern the, the people well. And God heard that prayer, blessed him with both wisdom and understanding, and breath of mind like the sand of the seashore. So that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman and Calco and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs he wrote 1,005 songs. And so again, just how wise was Solomon, well, he was able to write not only the book of Ecclesiastes, such an incredible book, he wrote 3,000 proverbs, and he wrote 1,005 songs. Now again, I was asked earlier, a couple weeks ago, where are his 1,005 songs? But the Bible only gives us one, okay? We only have one of his 1,005 songs recorded, but remember, we have his greatest hit, okay? We have the most important song that he wrote, the best of the best. And we know this because this is how Solomon speaks of the song of songs. He calls it in chapter one, verse one, this is the song of songs. This is the best of the songs that I've wrote, which is Solomon's. And so I love this because if you've been with us, again, we have been studying this beautiful love song, and that's exactly what it is. His greatest hit was a, a love song. And in this love song, it covers about a year and a half of his first relationship, right, with his first wife. Now, we know Solomon would go on to, to blow it and marry all these other women, but this is way before any of that happened. And so he is able to record for us their courtship together, their betrothal, or what we would call their engagement, their marriage, and then their new life together. And the reason I believe that we were given this book specifically in God's word is to teach us that marriage and sex were both created by God and they're good. Despite what we see today, despite marriages crumbling, despite sex that's been perverted, God created it to be beautiful and good. And we see as we take the time to study this book, the blessing and the benefit that comes when we do things the right way. God designed marriage. God created marriage to provide fulfillment and contentment with the one that he provided for us. 
And he did this so that we would not have to look for it somewhere else, so that we would not have to try to find or get our needs met elsewhere. We can find fulfillment and contentment in the one that God provided for us. Now again, if you were with us very quickly, we covered in the first chapter to chapter 2, verse 7, we covered their courtship. And in their courtship, Solomon recorded not only his uh, his beloved, she is called the Shulamite, her love that she expressed for Solomon, but also his affirming love back to her in return. And so we got to read about their relationship blossoming during their courtship. We then read in chapter 2, verse 8 to chapter 3, verse 5, the betrothal where Solomon made a a trip to her house. Remember, she lives out in the countryside. Solomon is a king living in a palace in Jerusalem, but he falls in love with this country girl, and he comes to propose to her. And of course, she says yes. Last week, if you were with us, we covered chapter 3, verse 6, to chapter 5, verse 1, and we covered three things. The wedding procession as Solomon came for his bride, the wedding, and the wedding night. And the focus of the chapter was all about Solomon, if you remember, taking us into the bedroom. It was a very sensitive uh, passage, but a beautiful passage as we were able to, to witness. It's almost like he brought us into the bedroom chamber so that we can experience what he experienced. Now, what was so beautiful, in case you weren't with us last week, is both Solomon and his Shulamite bride had saved themselves for marriage. And so it was extra special. It was extra exciting. Again, they were able to experience a specialness that sadly most people don't experience anymore because most people don't wait. And I believe God included this here so that we would learn from this, so that we could see the benefit that comes when we do it right. If we would only wait upon God, if we only do things right, we can experience exactly what Solomon experienced on his wedding night. Now, thus far, right, through the book, it's been beautiful. And we've heard them talk to each other, calling each other doves, and my love, and my beloved, and it's been all butterflies and rainbows. But how many of you know marriage is not all butterflies and rainbows? You can raise your hand, it's okay. (laughs) Tonight, as we get into it, we're gonna cover their first fight. That's what we're talking about. I know no one fights here, but he did, okay? He did. And I love this. Because we need to understand, every person needs to understand, if you don't know this already, that despite how wonderful, right, the one you love is, when you get married, you're going to experience conflict. Now, one of the interesting things, again, is that so often, and this has happened so many times, is that you talk to these lovebirds that are all in love, and they're excited, and they want to get married, and you tell them, I need to prepare you, because as wonderful as things are right now, one day you're going to have disagreements. One day the fights are going to come. One day things are going to get hard. And I can tell you with all honesty, because I've done a lot of premarital counseling, there have been many times where the couple looks at me and says, I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. As if every other couple, right, goes through things, but not them. Because they're so in love, and and they just care so much about each other. But the reality is, the honeymoon's going to end one day. And that season of love, we would call it, that season of excitement, when everything's brand new, guess what? It doesn't last forever. And one day, those feelings are going to rub off. And I can tell you those same exact couples that told me this will never happen to us, pastor, six months to a year after they're married, come back and say, "Uh, can we meet for counseling again? Because now the honeymoon phase ended. And now they're at each other's throat. Now they get into it. 
And I can tell you again, my wife and I have been married for 33 years. We don't have a perfect marriage. We understand the struggles. We've been through it. And if you're like us, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now tonight, again, with the honeymoon phase ended, we are going to see conflict. We're going to see their first conflict. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, one of the things that that couples experience during that honeymoon phase, I'll say, is, is two things. Number one, during the honeymoon phase, we are willing to make all the sacrifices that our spouse wants us to make. Anything you want, honey, right? Anything you want, sweetheart. It is so easy to be that way, to feel that way. And all of their faults, all of their issues, all of their idiosyncrasies, right? We are so easy to overlook during that honeymoon phase. But all of a sudden, when the honeymoon's over, it gets harder to make those sacrifices. Now the things that we overlooked now become issues that we struggle with. And I thought about it, and I'm sure you can agree, it's almost like buying a new car. Would you guys agree with that? You buy a new car... And you have no problem getting out there and putting in the work to wash that car every single day, right? No problem. The $1,000 payment with with insurance, right, that you have to pay, no problem in the very beginning when the car is brand new. But a year down the line, you're still washing that car every day. Now you're complaining about that $1,000 payment that you had no problem complaining about in the very beginning. This is what happens. This is life, right? I'm sorry to tell you, every relationship is easy or at least easier in the beginning. But once the honeymoon phase in is where the real work begins because we're going to have conflict. We're going to have disagreements. It doesn't matter who you are. We will all have conflicts. But get this, and this is what we're going to focus on tonight. As much as no one likes to have conflict, One of the things that we need to understand is that conflict can benefit our marriage. If you're taking notes, write that down. Conflict can benefit your marriage if you're willing to learn, okay? Conflict can benefit your marriage if you're willing to learn. You're going to go through things. You're going to have problems. You're going to have issues because you don't share the same brain. You don't see eye to eye. My pastor, David Rosales, he used an analogy that I thought was so beautiful. He said, single people are like rivers, flowing rivers. One is flowing this way and one is flowing this way. But all of a sudden, if those two rivers meet, what happens? You got commotion, don't you? You got stuff moving around. You got the dirt from the bottom of the river being kicked up because these rivers have been flowing for so long, and eventually when they meet, it causes commotion. And I think that's a beautiful picture of life, especially if you've been single for a long time. All of a sudden you get married, there's gonna be issues because you're so used to doing something a certain way, and now you are in conflict with someone who does something another way. The beauty, though, is when we learn to understand each other, When we take the time to communicate clearly our wants and needs, we can learn from the conflict and strengthen our marriage. And that's what we're going to see tonight in this passage. I've entitled it, The Honeymoon is Over. Okay, (laughs) The Honeymoon is Over. Pretty simple tonight, right? We're going to begin in chapter 5, verse 2, and we're going to go to chapter 6, verse 3 tonight. We are going to see the couple experience their first fight, okay? The couple experience their first fight, and the first thing that we're going to read about is the conflict itself, okay? The conflict itself. I hope you have a Bible in front of you again. It's such a beautiful passage to read. Let's begin in verse 2, right where we left off, and notice who's speaking. This is, it's a she above your Bible. It might say the Shulamite. This is Solomon's wife speaking. Well, it begins. She says, I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is wet with dew, 
my locks or my hair with the drops of the night. Once again, we are brought into a scene. And the scene is Solomon's wife. She's in bed and she's half asleep. That's the scene. She's half asleep when all of a sudden she hears a knocking at her door. And it's Solomon, her husband. Remember, we read that they got married last week. And so time has passed here. She's asleep one night in her bed, right? Is it, did they have a a different palace? Was there a palace for the king and palace for a queen? Or was it simply the queen's chamber? We don't know. But she's in her own room, she's in her own bed, but her husband comes and knocks on the door while she is half asleep. Now I love the details because if you were with us last week in chapter four, or you can even look back at verse one, Solomon kept referring to her as his bride. His bride, my bride. But now he doesn't refer to her as his bride anymore, which tells us months have passed. Maybe a year has passed. Time has passed. He no longer is in that honeymoon. He's no longer calling her his bride. Now he simply calls her, right? My sister, speaking of the permanence of their relationship, right? My love, my dove, my perfect one. He has all these beautiful nicknames for his wife. And he's asking her to open the door and to let him in. And I love this because what is he doing? Is he trying to butter her up? Is he trying to sweet talk her? He wants her to open the door. He wants her to let him in because he desires to be intimate with his wife. Now the question you should be asking, which is the question I ask, is why is this taking place? Why does he have to knock on the door, right? What's happening? Why is it so late? Why is she half asleep. Well, we read here that evidently, we don't know why, Solomon has been out all night. We know this because he talks about the fact that he's been out in the, in the middle of the night and his hair is wet with mist. He's been outside. He comes home and he's knocking on the door and he's asking her to let him in because he wants to sleep with his wife. Now, why was he out late? I wish we knew. We don't know. You know what's interesting? She doesn't know, or does she? Was he out late watching over his flocks? Was he out with the boys? We don't know why he was out. We don't know why he is out and why he comes home late. All we know is that he's in the mood for love. He comes home and he desires, right, that his wife will open the door so they can be intimate together. But what does she do? Well, keep reading, verse three. I had put off my garment. How could I put it back on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them or get them dirty again? I want you to imagine the scene, right? She's comfortable in bed. She's half asleep. He comes in. He wakes her up. She knows what he wants. But instead of getting up and opening the door for him, she starts making phony excuses. I'm already in bed. You need me to get up and put my robe on and go open the door for you? I already took a bath. You want me to get up and get my feet dirty? Are these excuses? Yeah, they're excuses. She's half asleep. Now what likely happened is maybe he had told her, I'll be home at nine, or I'll be home at 10, and we can spend time together. And so imagine the scene, and I think this is so practical. She anticipates him coming home at a certain time, maybe nine o'clock or whatever. And so she went and she took a bath, And maybe she lit some candles. Maybe she put on a negligee. And she's waiting for him to come home. When all of a sudden, the hours pass. From 9, it goes to 10, and 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 1. Maybe it's 2 in the morning. Maybe she sprayed her myrrh on her, right? Some perfume on her. 
She was waiting for him. And eventually, she got tired of waiting. And so eventually, she did what? She took off her negligee. She locked the door. She blew out the candles. And she tried to go to bed. Because she waited. And then what happens? He shows up. And he wakes her up. And so what's her response? It's too late now. That's her response, right? I'm not getting out of bed. You can sleep outside for I care. I read this and I thought, wow, whatever happened to love is patient, love is kind, right? But that's what we read here. Now, I love this. I love how, how practical this is. We read this today, and, and we, can we relate to this stuff? We recognize how, how real this is, how practical this is, even for us today. You know, it's so interesting. Again, you know, you can talk to singles, or you can talk to those that are engaged, especially if you talk to young men. And the idea they have in their head is, ooh, man, I can't wait to get married because then I can have sex anytime I want to. Maybe on your honeymoon. Maybe during the honeymoon phase, but is that, is that realistic? It's not. That's not reality. It's not. This idea, it's not real. But that's what we see here. How interesting that maybe during the honeymoon, yeah, maybe it was like that. But how easy when the honeymoon's over to begin to lose the willingness to give ourselves to our spouse whenever they want. And that's exactly what we see taking place. Now, again, we can see this from both sides. On one side, we could say, well, you know, it's Solomon's fault because he was, he was inconsiderate, right? He came home too late. And maybe all you ladies are like, yeah, yeah, right? But the truth is, maybe he had a good reason. We don't even, we don't even know that. And you know what? She didn't know that either. All we know is she shut him down. She didn't stop to say, why are you late? She didn't open the door for him. Again, in her mind, too late, too bad. And she just simply rejected him. And in this, again, we see, although he might have been inconsiderate, possibly, we see how insensitive she was. She knows why he's there. She doesn't take the time to find out why he is late. All she cares about is, you know what? Too bad. I'm already in bed. Don't expect me to get up. You should have been here earlier. And this is, again, what creates a problem. She's looking at him as thinking only of himself, when in reality she's only thinking of herself, and that doesn't work in marriage. That will always create conflict. And so I want you to imagine this scene, right? She's upset. She's irritated. She's not budging. And there he is outside the door knocking, right, for his wife to let him in. Now, one of the beautiful lessons I think that comes out crystal clear is that marriage is about denying ourselves. In order for a marriage to work, we have to deny ourselves. She forgot that. We forget that. You know, when we're single, we can live for ourselves. We can do whatever we want to do, right? We want to sleep in. We want to go out to eat. We want to do this. We, want to, we can do whatever we want. We don't have to ask anybody anything. But once we say, I do, guess what? It's no longer about what we want. Why? Because we have pledged our lives in a vow to no longer live for ourselves, but to live together as one. And that's the vow we make. It's no longer about us. It's not, we're not always going to be able to have our way. And this also relates to the area of sexual intimacy. We just covered this a couple weeks ago. I love God's timing. How many of you remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 Verses 2 to 5, he says, because of the sexual temptation, oh, I'm sorry, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, because of all the sexual sin out there and the temptation to sin sexually, 
Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. They're not supposed to be sleeping with anybody else. God has given us our own wife or our own husband to fulfill our needs. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Paul says, verse 5, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again. Why? So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self control. This is the wisdom that we find in the scripture. Be careful. Make sure you, again, take care of the needs of your spouse, which protects your marriage, which safeguards your marriage from your spouse, again, being tempted to satisfy their needs somewhere else. And so this is so interesting, because if we're honest, right, we have all been brought to that place. We're not in the mood. It's the wrong time. It's too late. Again, we can say whatever we want to say, and for that reason, we reject our spouse. It only creates problems. It only creates conflict in our marriage. And again, this is exactly what we're seeing take place. Now keep reading verse 4. My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh, on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. Now again, let me describe to you what had taken place. He's there for a while. He's knocking. He's calling. He's saying all these you know, sweet nicknames for her to, to let him in. She refuses to do it. He's out there for a while. He starts messing with the door, right? Seeing if, if he can come in. She begins to feel sorry for him. So that she eventually gives in. She eventually gets up to let him in. But she had taken so long. She had taken too long because by the time she gets to the door, Solomon's gone. And now she's the one calling for him. Something changed, right? He was calling for her. Now she's calling for him. But now, having been rejected, he's gone. He walks away, right? He disappears into the night. Interesting. James, the half-brother of Jesus, in James 4.1, he writes this. He says, what causes, what's the cause of our fights and quarrels? You can apply this in marriage. You can apply this in any relationship. What causes fights and quarrels amongst us? Don't they come from your, your wants and desires that battle within you? What what is the problem with our fights? Why do they arise? Well, it's real simple. Because we want something and we're willing to fight for what we want over someone who wants something else. And this happens in marriage. When we are unwilling to budge, when we are unwilling to give in, when we are unwilling to compromise, I want what I want and too bad and they say the same thing on their end, then this is why you get conflict. Now think about it. Whether he was wrong or whether he was right, had she gotten up out of bed, would they be in a conflict? No. No. But again, she was unwilling to budge. She was unwilling to even hear him out and why he was late, and so now they find themselves fighting. Now again, I'm married just like many of you. And as I read this again, I can reflect on so many times where me and my wife had our problems. And me and my wife were going at it and we had our fights. And I think especially in our early years, 
Oh, we fought like cats and dogs, my wife will tell you. The fact that we are together, married after 33 years, there's Jesus, right? Jesus at the center. Because he's the one that's able to, to keep us together. He's the, able, the one that's able to make marriage work. But I look back on both of us, and we were both young, and we were both selfish, and we both wanted what we wanted. And there were so many times when we, again, were at each other's throats. And I think back. I think back at how many nights were ruined I think back at how many days we were so angry and frustrated at one another. And that happened for months. It even happened for years until we finally got to the place that you get tired of fighting. You get tired of fighting. And then when you get tired of fighting, you come to the place when you recognize that, guess what? Because I'm tired of fighting, you recognize that not everything is worth fighting about. And then you begin to change. Then you begin to learn from your fights. You begin to learn to sacrifice. You begin to learn to compromise and not always get your way. You start talking more. You start communicating more because you don't want to ruin another night. And so you start communicating more and you begin to forgive more and let things go. And as that happens, I wish I could say it happened in a day, but it takes time. But as you begin to put these things into practice, you stop fighting all the time. Your fights, although we still have them, are less and less and less. I love it, right? I heard an analogy many, many years ago that our fights or conflicts as couples should be like earthquakes, okay? You ever heard this before? I love it. Our fights or conflicts in marriage should be like earthquakes. How many of you knew that on planet Earth, there are over a million earthquakes every year? That's a, that's a stat. You can look it up. But how many do we even recognize? Just a handful, right? Just a handful. And that's the way that conflict should be in marriage. Oh, we might have a million disagreements all year long, but only a handful should impact us. Only a handful, again, should, you know, cause us to, to, you know, to get into it and to stand our ground and to fight, you know, when we feel that that's necessary. But sadly, when we don't have that mindset, we can make mountains out of molehills, right? We can fight about anything. And we need to learn from this so that we stop doing this. One of the lessons that hopefully we all recognize, along with not everything's worth fighting about, is there reaches a point in a disagreement where someone needs to walk away. Does that make sense? Instead of keeping it going, how many of you know you keep going, you're going to eventually say the wrong thing, and now you're going to blow it out of proportion? And so maturity says that someone, someone has to be wise. Someone has to simply walk away. Oh, it doesn't mean you let it go. You can resolve it, hopefully when tempers cool down. But wisdom says walk away. And I love this because you know what? That's exactly what happened. Solomon didn't keep fighting. He didn't start pounding on the door. He didn't start yelling. What did he do? He simply walked away. And that's beautiful because what a lesson that we see here. But there's something else, and I don't want you to miss this. Look back at verse 5. Look at what it said in verse 5. It says that she got up to open the door for her beloved, and her hands dripped with myrrh, perfume, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the door. Now, this is really, really interesting. She gets up to open the door for him. She opens the door, and all of a sudden, on her hands are, is perfume dripping from her hands. Now, what's going on here? It's kind of beautiful. Well, back then, husbands would anoint the door handles of their bride's room with fragrant oils. 
And it was a way to say, I love you. It was like leaving a note, we would say. And that's what Solomon did. Despite the fact that he didn't get what he wanted, despite the fact that she rejected him, although he walked away, he took the time to anoint her door handles with perfume. Wow, that, that's amazing. Look what he did. He, he walked away. He, he, he didn't, again, elevate things or make things worse. And even though he walked away, he let her know that he loved her. He anointed her doorknobs with perfume. Now, what's so important about this, and, and again, you know, one of the things that, that every Christian couple should understand is that the benefit that we have as believers, the reason why we are only to marry another believer is because oftentimes we are trying to get through to our spouse and it's not going anywhere. Have we ever been there, right? But we have a secret weapon that unbelievers don't have. It's called the Holy Spirit. And so oftentimes when we're in a conflict, when we can't see eye to eye and we wish we could get across to them or point across to them, we have a secret weapon where we are able to walk away without fighting, without elevating things and simply take it to God in prayer and say, God, because you are inside them as you are inside me, speak to them and get through to them because I can't. And God's able to do that. Isn't that beautiful? And so I love this because the lesson that we see tonight is that we don't have to make things worse. We don't have to say the wrong thing. We don't have to do the wrong thing. We can simply walk away and allow God to work. Allow God to deal with them. We don't have to have the last word, guys, right? We can allow God to deal with them. We can allow the Spirit of God to convict their heart. And I love this because we see what a beautiful lesson, whether we are husband or spouse or, or bride tonight, right? We can all do this. We can all learn from this. This teaches us how, in the midst of our conflict, we can properly respond to our spouse. And guess what? It worked. How do we know that? And we'll keep reading. Verse 7. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city, they beat me and they bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. Now she's describing here, remember, this is a poem, this is a song, right? She's describing that after she recognized that she made a mistake, her husband she rejected. He loves her. He showed her he loves her. He didn't say anything or push to try to get his way. He simply walked away. She now feels guilty. And now she wants him now. And so she describes herself looking for him about the city. And she says that she comes across the, the watchmen. Who are the watchmen? These are the guards of the city. And she describes them beating her up, right? Right? Now let me ask you a question. Do you honestly think the guards of the city would beat up the queen? Probably not. And so most scholars say she's simply describing how she felt. On the inside, she felt guilty. She felt beat up over what she had done, over the way she had treated the one that she loved. And so, feeling this way, look what she does. Verse 8, she is, I adjure you, I'm begging you, she says, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. Now, we have read about the daughters of Jerusalem, remember? They were her bridesmaids. They were the ones that every once in a while came in and sang the chorus of the song, right? We read this before. Maybe that early that next morning, she goes to her friends and she says, help me find him. Oh, help me find my beloved. I'm, I'm lovesick. Help me find him. And so they respond. Verse 9. What? Notice the what. What is your beloved more than another beloved? Oh, most beautiful among women. 
what is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? Here she's asking, help me find him. I'm sick with love. I need to find him. And they turn to her and they say, what's so special about him? Why should we go out of our way to help you find him? What's so special about him? And then she goes on to answer that question. And that brings us to the second thing. She is now feeling that conviction. She is now feeling guilty over the way she treated the one who loved her. And so she responds to their question, what is so special about him? And she says, verse 10, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. She's talking about his complexion. Distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold. He's smart. He's wise. His locks, his hair is wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, peaceful. Bathed in milk, sitting beside a pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripped, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns set on gold, bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars, right? He's tall, he's strong, he's muscular. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, what's really beautiful about just these verses is that it was extremely rare for a woman to describe the features of a man. And the only other place in all of Scripture where the features of a man are described is in the book of Revelation when John describes how Jesus looked. Interesting. No other place are the features of a man described. Now, if you were with us last week, you might remember that as they were together in the bedroom chamber before they were intimate, he described to her how beautiful she was. And he described her, her features. And if you compared last week and this week and the passages, they're the same. She describes him from head to toe. His head, right, his hair, his arms, his torso, right, his thighs, his legs, she describes him. Not only how handsome and attractive he was on the outside, but she is speaking of his, his character, his wisdom, the words that he speaks, and how she, she's so in love with him, not only, again, because of what he is on the outside, but the quality man that he is on the inside, which is why I look back at verse 10, she says, he is distinguished among 10,000. Today, we would say what? He's one in a million. That's what she's saying. That's exactly what she is saying. She's describing, again, just how incredible he is. Now, what's sad about this, again, think about this. What's sad about this is we read her describe him. These are her words. She's saying how wonderful of a man he is, right? Both outwardly and both inwardly. Well, think about it. If he's so wonderful, why did you reject him? Right? Because that's exactly the question. But what's so interesting about this is she knew all along how wonderful he was. But let's be honest, married couples. How easy is it for us to forget how wonderful our spouse is? Especially as the years go on, right? We begin to take them for granted. Because we get used to them. Because it's normal. We wake up next to them every day. And we take them for granted. And so how interesting. How many of you agree that it's probably a good idea every once in a while to remind ourselves just how special our spouse is to us? 
so that once again we can appreciate what we have. Because that's what happened. Here with her own words, she's talking about he's wonderful. He's one in a million, outwardly and inwardly. And as she says that, it probably even makes her feel more guilty. She pushed this man away. She rejected the one who loves her. But there's good news tonight as we look at the last thing. There's good news. The commitment. Would we say the marriage is about commitment? Yes. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Where has your beloved gone? O most beautiful among women, where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Now remember, she had asked them for help, right? She gathered her bridesmaids together likely early that next morning. They wanted to know what was so special about him. She told them. She told them, right? Everything how special he was, how much he meant to her. And so they say, okay. Now their question is, where's he gone? I believe what they were saying is, if he's so wonderful, how did you let him go? That's what they're asking. That's what they wanted to know. And so how does she respond as we close tonight? She says, verse 2, My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to graze in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Notice, to graze in the gardens, and to gather lilies. And she says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. Now, what's so beautiful about this, again, and we're closing is that after she reminded herself of everything her man is, she was comforted. When she reminded herself that he is a man of character, that he is a godly man, right? That he is special on the inside and out, she was comforted, why? Because she knew she had not lost him. Once she recognized and reminded herself again of the quality man she has married, she knew he wasn't lost. She knew she didn't even have to go looking for him. Because she knew her man, she knew where he was at. And I love that. Because she knew her man, she knew where he was at. And she tells them, I know where he's at. He's at work. That's where he's at. He's at work. He's at work pasturing or feeding his flock. And she says, you know what else I bet he's doing? I bet he's gathering lilies. Why would he gather lilies? For himself? No. She says, I know what he's probably doing. Because he loves me, and because I, know, I believe he's already forgiven me, he's at work. But before he leaves for work, he's going to gather lilies and bring me home flowers to show me how much he loves me. Again, what an example, right? An example for all of us, for, for husbands and wives. We're going to have issues. We're going to have struggles. We're not going to see eye to eye. Sometimes our problems are going to separate us. But through the ups and downs of marriage... We're committed, amen? We are called to be committed to the one we love, despite the struggles that we might have. We belong to them, and they belong to us. And that's exactly what she said, understanding that that's the way God created marriage to be. Next week, Lord willing, we see them reunite. After the, the conflict should come reconciliation, and that will be the focus of our text next week. Let's pray tonight. Thank you, Lord, tonight for your word, Lord. What a beautiful passage. What wisdom, Lord God, that we find in the scriptures, Lord God. Again, whether we are married today or whether maybe one day we will be married, we need this wisdom. We need this instruction, Lord, because we are selfish. Oftentimes, we can let our pride get in the way. 
But Lord, you desire, Lord God, that we, we walk in peace and forgiveness and mercy because we married a sinner and so did our spouse. Lord, give us that understanding. Lord God, give us grace where we need it. Help us to come to that place, Lord God, in our marriages where we're tired of fighting, where we want to live at peace, Lord God, where we want to have a marriage that, that not only honors you, but a marriage, Lord God, that, that brings satisfaction and contentment in each and every one of our lives. And so, Lord, through your wisdom, through your instruction, Lord, continue to teach us. Learn us, grow us as we continue to study your word. We love you, we thank you tonight, Lord, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let's stand tonight.